certain young lady calls her boyfriend and says, please come over here and help me. I have a jigsaw puzzle and I can't figure out how to get it started. Her boyfriend asks, well, what's it supposed to be when it is finished? The young lady says, according to the picture on the box, it's a tiger. Well, her boyfriend decides to stop by and help with the puzzle. She shows him where she has all the puzzles spread out all over the table. He studies the pieces for a moment. Then he looks at the box, and he turns to her and said, first of all, no matter what we do, we're not going to be able to assemble these pieces into anything resembling the tiger. And he takes her by the hand and says, second, I advise you to relax. Let's have a cup of coffee. Then as he sighs, let us now put all those sugar frosted flakes back in the box. <laughs> Let's face it, life is puzzling. Relationships are puzzling. Even faith is puzzling if it's mature faith. Whoa, whoa, did I say that right? Mature faith is puzzling? I still remember Reverend Wilbur Miser, once pastor here at this church, and my counseling elder, saying to me when I entered the ministry, as you go on your faith journey, you will grow and you will gain new insights to, into God's will. Things will change. Now, two of the vows we take before annual conference as we receive our venture into the ordained ministry are, are you going on to perfection? And are you earnestly striving after perfection in love? You know, a person who is maturing in the Christian faith is always asking themselves questions about their faith. What does God want out of me? This is why I have that moment, just moment of prayer. What does God want out of me? God, please tell me. We are all striving for that perfection. Faith sometimes is puzzling as we're doing that. How do we start putting the puzzle of faith, put these pieces of life, how do we put them back together? Even the most expert puzzle fans know that it's much easier to put together a puzzle if you first look at the picture on the box. The picture in the front of the box is a guide to helping you make sense of all those hundreds of little disjointed puzzle pieces. If someone handed you a box of pieces, just pieces, you'll, you'll drive yourself crazy trying to make some sense out of what the picture is going to be or should be. But with a picture as a guide, you have a fighting chance to make something sensible, even beautiful, out of all those pieces. There was a little boy who was bothering his father while his father was reading a magazine. The father decided to occupy the little boy by tearing a page out of the magazine and, and cutting it into pieces. Then he had the little boy try to put the pieces back together. Now he thought that this would, uh, this would occupy the boy for a long time. But he was wrong. In a short time, the boy had the page reassembled. His dad asked how he had done it so quickly. And the boy replied, oh, it was easy. There was a picture of a man on the other side. And when I got the man right, explained the boy, everything fell into place. Now, I know this is an old story, but it is an important one, especially when it comes to the Gospel of John. The author of John's Gospel has seen the picture on the other side of the piece of paper. 
It is a picture of Jesus. Life is no longer random or meaningless jumble of pieces anymore. God has revealed himself through Jesus Christ. He has given us a picture now that we are to put the pieces now back together. Jesus is there. Now put it back together. That's the message of the book of John. John opens his gospel with this declaration about Jesus. In him was life, and that life was the light of men. And I'll include women with that. Two chapters later, he records Jesus' encounter with an elderly Pharisee named Nicodemus. When Nicodemus is slow to comprehend how he, an old man, can experience a second birth, Jesus blows him away with this promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John has seen the big picture. And he can stop talking, and he can't stop talking about it. He has found the key to life. If you want to know the purpose of your life, look to Jesus. In today's lesson, John is writing about a time in Jesus' ministry when the crowds are starting to fade away. Jesus' teachings were too hard to grasp. They challenge too many preconceived notions about faith and its meaning. His ministry, which had once seemed to be so promising, was now in trouble. He wasn't telling them what they expected or what they wanted to hear. Jesus understood what was happening. He turned to his 12 who had been with him from the beginning. Do you not want to leave too? Well, do you? Jesus asked them. And it was the unmanageable disciple Simon Peter who, who answered with one of the most beautiful statements in Scripture. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Simon Peter knew Jesus' New Jesus is the picture on the box. He is the key to the puzzle of life. Lord, whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. A small boat makes its way across the angry waters of the Mediterranean Sea. On board is a Christian woman named Monica. Tossed about by the waves, the experienced crew seeks to calm the fears of the passengers. But Monica needs no assurance. In fact, it is she who calmly promises the troubled sailors that everything will be just fine. Monica's son, Augustine, faced his own stormy seas. At his home in Italy, awaiting his mother's arrival from Africa, Augustine was in a dangerous state of depression. What he was depressed about was his own search for meaning of life. Augustine was born in 300, 354 in a Roman province in North Africa. His father was a Roman pagan, his mother a devout Christian. An avid reader and a lifelong student, Augustine poured over the various philosophical teachings of his day in, in a vain attempt to understand what good and evil and sin and virtue, heaven and hell. And he tried it all. He tried it all. In his own words, as a youth, he ran wild in the shadowy jungle of erotic adventure. Augustine had been raised in the church. He found the old Latin version of the Bible uninviting. And so he explored other avenues of truth. But each of these he discarded as inadequate. 
that one day his mother Monica introduced him to the teachings of Ambrose, a Christian bishop whom he knew and respected greatly. In the summer of 386, Augustine was in the garden waging a spiritual debate in himself. He felt so trapped by the sins of his past that he broke down in tears. Then he heard a voice of a child chanting, Pick up and read. Pick up and read. He felt this was the voice of God. So he found his Bible, he opened it, and he began to read from Romans 13, 13, and 14. Let us behave discreetly as in the daytime, not in orgies or drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and wickedness, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Augustine would then write about his conversion. I neither wish nor need it to read further. At once, with the last words of this sentence, it was as if a light of relief from all anxiety flooded into my heart. All the shadows of doubt were dispelled. The following Easter, Augustine was baptized. His mother, Monica, lived to see her son's conversion. and She died a few years later with her prayers answered. Augustine embraced Christ with such a passion that eventually he was ordained and later became a bishop. And his writings have an enormous impact on Western thought. And I can still remember in seminary, we studied St. Augustine (laughs) and his theology. And it has a lot of effect on me and I know anybody else who took a course of Christology. Augustine discovered what Simon Peter discovered. The key to the puzzle of life is Christ. Millions of people of every walk of life, have discovered this truth. They have seen the picture on the box. The picture was Jesus. You know, growing up in a Christian church culture may, may blind us all, you know, to the, to the Christ call. You know, and that's true. Sometimes we get blinded with what Christ is calling us to do, putting that armor on, to stand up for Jesus. If we lived or are living today, I'll say present day, if we lived or live present today, influence or influence in a culture of that was or is hostile to Christian values, we would see the stark difference Christ has made in people's lives. Some people live in a culture in which girls count for so little that girl babies are slain at birth. Women are not considered equal to men, and they are to be subordinate to men's desires. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not his gospel. That's not God's gospel. Some people live in a culture in which other faiths are considered People of other faiths are considered infidels and they're shunned for not having the same faith and could be punished or slain without any guilt. That's not the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's not the Christian culture of Christ. Some people believe you should not help the poor because they're just being punished for misdeeds or, or they're, they're just not as intelligent as you. Because they're poor, they they just should be done away with. There are cultures, there are governments, leaders of governments, and people like that in today's world. If they only would follow the teachings of Jesus, if only they would follow those teachings, love others as you love yourself. That's the culture of Christ church. Maybe it's impossible for us to objectively view view our own faith because 
we're, we're so, so surrounded by other cultures of other people's feelings. We, we, we sometimes just assume, we just sometimes assume that people are giving are doing things out of love and respect for all people. And we become blind to Satan that is out there. That's how we've been raised. We've been isolated from the world. And we're raised in a way, that way because we have the influence. We, we are raised in a way of Christ. Why are people doing such things to other people? That's not the way we were raised. That's not what we, we hear in the church. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the key to making sense out of life. You know, there are many diverse philosophies in the world today. Some of them are quite bizarre. The September 5th, 2005 issue of Newsweek magazine focused on the spirituality in America. The author of the lead article makes it the point that more and more people today are creating their own religions out of mixed orthodox and non-traditional practices and beliefs. In a couple of weeks, I'll be talking more about traditional doctrines and beliefs. But for now, among the many people that were quoted in the central article was a young woman, a student getting her doctorate in religion and nature at the University of Florida. The article's author noted that this young woman's idea of worship consists of composing, recycling, and a daily five-mile run. I hope it works for her, but I do have my doubts. From all evidence I've seen, no, there's no alternative faith offers anything that is even close, that is even close to the power of the words of Jesus. Simon Peter turned to Jesus and said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. That is why we have gathered here in worship this day. We haven't come because, well, it's our tradition. We haven't come just to see our friends. We haven't come just because we enjoy the music. Now, all these are all well and good, and they're important. However, if any of these are the only reason you're here today, you're probably not going to have a truly uplifting experience of Christ. Such reasons for worship in G.K. Chesterton's words reveal that our religion, if this is the way we are, is more a theory than a love affair. A love affair. I hope you're here today because you have a love affair with God. You have an agape love affair with God. I hope you're here because you have found that Christ has the words of eternal life. Malcolm Muggeridge accompanied a film crew in, to India in order to narrate a documentary documentary on the life of Mother Teresa. He already knew she was a good woman or he wouldn't have bothered going. But when he met her, he found a good woman who was also very compelling that he titled his documentary, Something Beautiful for God. When he remarked to Mother Teresa on the fact that she went to Mass every day at 4.30 a.m., she replied, if I didn't meet my master every day, I'd be doing no more than social work. I hope you're here today to meet Christ. I hope 
you're not here for some other reason. I hope you're here to listen for Christ's words for your life. And I hope you find what John and Simon Peter and Augustine and Mother Teresa found. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. I ask us today, have Christ help you put the puzzle together. Amen. Let us pray. Holy God, whose temple is all of creation, hear us this day who call upon you in this temple, this church, built by human hands, and, and grant that all that we do here and all that we say here may be a true reflection of your love for all of your creation. Help us put life's puzzle together as we look at the picture of Jesus on the box. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, take a prayerful spirit into your everyday world. Trust in God to lead and guide you in truth. Do your best to extend God's reign. Amen.